I'm not talking about writing. Is that all right? <laughs> no, you don't know what I'm talking about, do you? Because no, no one said what I was talking about, so what are you doing sitting in here? <laughs> How many of you here from Yorkshire? Hi. <laughs> you can't answer the question, all right? Lips are sealed. I'm talking to everyone else who's not from Yorkshire. Not Yorkshire born and bred, not a type. I'm going to talk to you in Yorkshire. You get £5,000 if you can tell me what I said, all right? Oh, God, that doesn't look like anything I understand yet. Hey, up to this, like an art! <laughs> Nobody wants my money. <laughs> Who said that? Are you Yorkshire? No, North Wales. Well, how the hell did you do that? Worked in Yorkshire for 12 years. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I said, hello, are you coming out to play? <laughs> but if you teach in a school where they only talk Yorkshire, they haven't got much chance, have they? Because it's a different language, and it's a lovely language, and I adore it. But it doesn't have meaning in an educational context and it doesn't help those children to succeed in exams. And I bet if their house was on fire, they wouldn't be grabbing their GCSE notes as the first thing they want to say. Um, so it's a big issue how children talk. And uh, I was in here for the session before about talk, which I found very interesting. Was anyone else in here for that? very interesting talk. But the, the only little bit that I think needs clarifying is that that 30 million words is not 30 million different words, if you see what I mean. There could be one million ands in that 30 million words. It just means that in the talk around the table, if you counted every word, every time it came up, it adds up to 30 million. So it's not quite as daunting. It doesn't mean you have to know <coughs> 30 million words to be able to talk with your children around the dinner table and tick them off as you say them so that you know that you've used the right number of words today. That would be great fun, wouldn't it? Um, here we go, inspirational curriculum. Thank you very, very much. Not that, that's the power one hand there, that's it. It's a gentleman. So I I'm, I'm wanted to talk today about something that actually this man here, who I didn't know until about six weeks or two months ago, who is a highly rated Leeds head teacher, primary head teacher, um, I don't think he asked me to talk about anything. What did you ask me to talk about when I came to your school? Just to inspire. Him. To inspire. So I talked about inspiration, and I talked about uh, inspirational curriculum, and I talked about, uh, touched on uh, inspirational teaching. And it set me off on a journey, because what most people don't know about me is that I'm not an expert on writing, even though that's what I've become known as. I am an expert on, oh, don't flick through them. Done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I'm an expert on talking. You know, that's my hobby, it's my main pursuit, and I adore doing it, and I adore having people trapped in a room with me who can't get away <laughs> while I talk to them. So that's where we're starting from, and we should have a very good basis for the session based on that. Uh, when I uh, had the privilege of becoming a local authority advisor in Kirklees, my brief, my title if you like, was for curriculum and assessment. That was my expertise, that area. And it was only through uh, having to, being forced to, almost ashamed to admit it after some of the wonderful things we heard said by the panel this morning, but to lead the implicate, uh, uh, the, uh, I've lost the word, of SATS in 1992, which was the second year of the uh, introduction of testing in primary schools, having to train the teachers on how to implement uh, 
that's the word I'd lost, SATs, and how to audit and how to mark and how to moderate and all those things, that I developed the first criterion scale for mark for writing because there was no real support. The uh, SAT criteria were distinctly non-helpful and they were written in continuous prose. And it was through using that embryonic model, which is now far more complex and accurate, in the marking of many thousands of pieces of writing that realised that there were four toolkits to writing, two watts and two hows, and that the two watts and one of the hows are simplistic, they're easily understood, they're either right or they're wrong, they're like maths, they're like science, the type of text that you're writing using the correct features, responding accurately to stimulus and your basic skills. They're not necessarily easy, but they should be easy if we taught them correctly from the beginning and had higher expectation, which is grammar, handwriting, spelling and punctuation. But the fourth toolkit is the missing link and that's writer's voice and that's what no one has ever taught because we've always believed that they'll get better at it by reading and having realized that writer's voice was the problem that was holding a lot of children back that and basic skills because we weren't teaching them well enough as i was went on assessing i was focusing on the voice and it became obvious that there were four strands that made writing the voice more and more effective as the children matured, and that was the VCOP. So it all came out of assessment, and it all came out of the fact that I was an assessment person. But in actual fact, I'm far more, no, I'm not more passionate, not now, but I'm equally passionate about the classroom being a place of inspiration for children. Because when I worked on that team, there were 60 inspectors and advisors on that team in Kirklees. It was a driving force in across the country, Kirklees was, in the 90s. It's certainly not now. We had a whole team professional development day. And uh, the man who led us, who actually became the chief education officer in Leeds, I don't know if he's retired now, Dirk Gilliard, a wonderful man, he asked us one in this course of this training day, who was your most inspirational teacher when you were at school? Think back over all your years of schooling, your seven years in primary, your six, seven, whatever, uh, in secondary education. Who was the most inspirational teacher? And I hope as I'm saying the words of Dick Gilliard, Dirk Gilliard, you are thinking back over your schooling and looking for your most inspirational teacher. And I sat there and I racked my brains. And do you know, the sad indictment on my education, which of course was in the late 40s and through the 50s, up to 1961 in school, I could not find one inspirational teacher. How sad is that? Or at least they didn't inspire me. Perhaps that's about me and not about the teachers. I can find some good teachers. I can find teachers who clearly <coughs> knew their stuff. I can find some teachers I really didn't like at all, and some who I suspected didn't know very much. This is girls' grammar school context, you have to remember. So there are an awful lot of other teachers out there, and it was here in Leeds. But how sad that not one teacher had inspired me. But I played the game because after we'd thought for a few minutes, Dirk said to us, now having identified your inspirational teacher, without speaking to your friends, identify the qualities in that person's teaching that made them inspirational for you. And I'm asking you to do that now. 
identify <coughs> that most, doesn't matter whether they're secondary or primary, what were the qualities that made, that inspired you? Can you drill those down into some buzzwords? And can you turn to the people sitting nearest to you? If you don't know them, give them a hug and make friends. <laughs> and can you share? You're going to have a hard job, love, aren't you? <laughs> Come and play with Chris, because he's wonderful. <laughs> Go for it. Uh, can you just share some of those key words? Because I'm going to ask you to throw some back at me in a minute. <laughs> I hope you can airbrush this video. I hope you can airbrush it. Slim me down. Now you're just chatting among yourselves, are you? She's going to want to this story. It'll be on. Uh -huh. That's a lovely. Wonderful. Uh, so you have to name him as your inspiration. Thank you, everyone. Did you find that there were some commonalities in the buzzwords you were sharing? That there was an overlap? That you, some of the qualities in your inspirational teacher were the same as in your colleague's inspirational teacher? Could you throw some of those common words at me, please? Uh, can you do them in a simple language in case I have trouble with my spelling? <laughs> Sorry, you have to shout at me. Fun. I can spell that. Nurturing. That's like a bit harder. <laughs> <laughs> Enthusiastic. Inspiring. Could you say that again, please? Fun. Inspiring. Inspiring. Resilient. Oh gosh, can I spell that? Can I put tough? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. Resilient. I haven't written that word for a long time. Is that right or not? Yeah. Passionate. Oh, I can do that. I'm all for passion. Confident. Going great, guns here. Trust. Trust. They trust you and you trust them, both. Relatable. Relatable. Relate relevant, can I put? Okay. Is it the same? No. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I can't put it, but it's not the same. <laughs> Thank you. Enough? Enough. Why hasn't anyone shouted they knew all the maths in the world? Or they knew all the history in the world? Or they had the neatest writing on the whiteboard? <laughs> it's always about personality and qualities as a person. Always. I've done that many times, thanks to Dirk. I don't plagiarise ever. <coughs> And I've always had similar words, always. So if you're going to be the teacher that inspires your pupils, if you're going to inspire your pupils so much that they want to come back and teach with you, how sad is that? <laughs> she survived him and she went back and joined his staff. 
If you're going to have that effect on your pupils, these must be some of the qualities that you need to convey to your children. Even on the days, and it was said very well this morning, even on the days when you've got a headache, or you're worrying about the dog, or you can't remember whether you locked the door or not, and right now I haven't a clue where my mobile phone is, but you have to park that baggage and do the job for the sake of the kids. Because the words that come out of your mouth today will only pass by once. You will never do it the same again. And I look at that list and, and I have taught uh, secondary, primary and middle school. Uh, I'm a faker, you know, I can go in and do it anywhere with anyone. <laughs> she said. <laughs> Can you just wipe that bit of video? <laughs> <laughs> but more latterly, very much primary. So I've had to teach across the whole curriculum. And I can look at those words and I can say, when am I that teacher? I mean, I could say to you, when were you last that teacher? Which was the last lesson you taught, if you're still in the classroom, when those words would have been applied to you? thing is that the answer should be well it was the last lesson on Friday afternoon and when was the last one before that well it was the next the last lesson on Friday afternoon we should be that all the time the reality is we're not and in my checkered career of faking I have been Ofsted I have been AST assessor I've been strategy manager I have seen many outstanding teachers but they will all confess to you that the lesson they just taught in front of you, yes, they agree they were outstanding, but they don't actually teach like that all the time. It's impossible to sustain that excitement and that passion. And I can sustain it most of the time when I'm teaching English and when I'm teaching art, because they're my main subjects. I can sustain it in much of history. There's some periods of history I don't care much about. There's some periods of history that children don't care much about, and I doubt it's changed my life any, having to swat up the facts to pass my GCE and then forget them the next day, so much so that I can't tell you anything about those periods of history. And if you ask any children what their favorite periods are, you'll get, cavemen and dinosaurs, none of which are allowed anymore. And the next most favourite, of course, is the Tudors. And when you say, well, was it Henry VIII chopping his wife's heads off? Was it Elizabeth for being a strong <coughs> and austere leader? No, it was piss pots being emptied out of the windows. <laughs> That's why they remember the Tudors. That's what Tudors are about, and I love it. <laughs> I can be that, well, you can't be that teacher teaching four rules in maths, you know, adding and subtracting and multiplying and dividing, because there's nothing passionate about that. I'm a pretty good teacher of four rules. And I'm good at data handling. And I quite like geometry. I can be pretty passionate about that with a compass. <laughs> <laughs> but when it comes to shape, space, and measures, I haven't a clue. You know, that was a scowly face lesson. That was getting the classroom before the kids. Fill the board with the drawing of the shapes copied out of the book, because although I've been doing it 10 years, I still don't know the names. Put the names in the middle, kids come in, you fold your arms, you say, do that. And your whole body language and your voice is saying, and don't ask me one question, because if it ain't on the whiteboard, I don't know it. <laughs> And ask me if I care. That's why I don't know it, because I don't care. Do you know, colleagues, I am 72 years old. You can gasp in amazement. <laughs> I have never had to go into B&Q and ask for a polygon-shaped anything in my whole <laughs> life. And I doubt I will now. Polygons, hexagons, octagons, they're all gone, and I don't know where they've gone, <laughs> but I haven't missed them, and that's the truth. 
so how can I be passionate about them? I can be passionate about a lot of geography, not all geography. I'm never passionate about music unless you call singing loudly out of tune while you bang things enthusiastically passion. I can do that very, very well. I was a pretty good PE teacher. I know you'll doubt that. I didn't always look like this, and I've just asked this nice lady to airbrush the film, so I look rather slimmer on it. I'm still pretty fit, you know. There's not just one six-pack in there. <laughs> and that's a fact. But when it comes to design technology, I haven't a clue. When it comes to ICT, I haven't a clue. I grew up in the days when we didn't have electricity, anything electrical in the house at all, except the radio. It was the only piece of electrical equipment in the house. I remember the first washing machines, the first fridges, the first record players, and of course the television, which we all saw our first one on the day of the Queen's coronation, but we all crowded into the rich person's house to watch it. We got our first television the year after I left school. And it stood this high on the floor and the picture was that big and it snowed all the time and it was black and white. So I grew up in the days when your mother would go, don't touch that, you'll break it. Anything electrical, don't touch it. So I still then touch it. You notice I had to have a whole team of talented people to stick a pen drive in and find a programme for me. If my computer on, I shout and my little grandson comes around from next door and puts it right for me because they haven't grown up in that culture of don't touch it, you'll break it. They're not scared to kick it and turn it off and turn it on again. So you have to have, therefore, the subject knowledge, don't you? If you haven't got the subject knowledge, you haven't got the confidence to let go and show your passion and show your enthusiasm and welcome questions and challenges from the thinking body of the class. So there are a lot of things behind it. So do we have to have an inspirational curriculum, well, it, it would be nice if we did, it would be nice if schools had, but they don't. Can I ask that I was nice to you? Can you just run up and down the rows and just throw some on the end, please? You see, if I hadn't, I was in this room for the first session. Can you believe I left the first session early so as not to be late? I walked down that way looking for room A. <laughs> I walked down that way through the crowds looking for room A. And then I was rescued. <laughs> and I just came in a different door. It was the second <laughs> coming. And that's why I wasn't ready. And I do grovel on my knees and apologise for that. So it would be lovely to have an inspirational curriculum, but I can tell you, and I know that those of the, the many of you who are senior leaders will know, that a mediocre teacher can make an inspirational curriculum mediocre. And an inspirational teacher can make a mediocre curriculum inspirational. It's the person who makes the difference, and that's surely very important. I didn't have an inspirational teacher, I've told you that. So where do you learn inspiration, if I've ever got anywhere near it in my life? Usually, if you haven't had <coughs> inspirational teaching in school as a model, and you haven't had an inspirational lecturer as a model, then you go for your first five years of teaching, don't you? And most of us did spend a lot of our first five years watching and listening to the teachers who we considered to be very effective and learning from them on the job. Well, I spent my first five years in Normanton Secondary Modern. 
And if you're from round here, you'll know Normie, next door to Castleford. I remember my first day at Normie like it was yesterday. I sailed up to the school front door on my under 50, brum, 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 brum. And there was a lovely big space at the bottom of the front steps. So I thought, how nice, they've cleared a space for my little bike and I parked it there. And standing on the steps, there was this really scowly faced woman. And you know, it's my first day in the profession. She didn't hug me. <laughs> she didn't say welcome to the profession. She didn't even shake my hand. She said, follow me. So I followed her. And we galloped down several corridors and we came to a door and she physically pushed me in and she thrust a register at me and she said this is your room and this is your register and she never spoke to me again in the whole five years i was in that school that was molly wormold the second deputy head i'd been hiding in that room for four days faking being a teacher when on the fifth day morning, I became aware there was a kerfuffle going on outside my classroom door. And I knew I was supposed to be a teacher and I was supposed to do something about kerfuffles. So I opened my door a crack and I peered out. And opposite my door, there was the most beautiful polished open tread staircase, new 60s build. I'd never seen an open tread staircase in my life. And dripping through the stairs, there was copious amounts of blood. And I edged along the wall and I looked up the stairs and there was a gang of lads on the stairs and one of them had a Stanley knife and he'd slashed another one across the forehead and you know how it's one of those parts of the body where it just pops open and it was bleeding profusely. And I froze. Nothing in my years of education had told me what to do in a situation like this. But luckily at that moment, through a door over there, burst Bernard the Bastard. <laughs> now I have to call him that because it's the only name I knew for him. <coughs> Everybody called him that. He was the head of maths. And he was clutching a huge briefcase. And I thought, how useful at a moment like this. But it was, you see, because he put his briefcase down and out of it, he took the largest maternity sanitary towel you have ever seen in your life. I don't know if any of you remember them. They used to come with loops. And I thought, how perfect at a time like this. But it was, because he put that sanitary towel round the lad's forehead, <laughs> and he tied the loops in a bow at the back, and it was perfect. He was doing the job it was made for. Didn't do much for the lad's street cred, but it did a lot for the blood. And so I've travelled the planet since then with a large briefcase stuffed full of maternity sanitary towels, just in case. But I've never needed them. Sadly, Bernard had to leave the profession shortly after. He was arrested for shoplifting, but it wasn't in a chemist, it was in Halfords. Cool bikes. <laughs> So I didn't learn inspiration in Normanton. I learned an awful lot in Normanton, but not much about inspiration. We've done that. That was my second job. I moved to primary to, be, to uh, start a, a remedial class for them. And that is the staff of Slack Lane Primary in Crofton near Wakefield. Place spot the head teacher. No, like he's, that, <laughs> he's that one, I'm having trouble with my, my little light, doesn't want to play. Mr Townsend, mm. Mr Townsend, which one's the deputy head, it's not the other man, and it would be now, but it wasn't then. <laughs> Front row, second from left, little light won't come on, need a battery, sorry. Mrs. Sparrowhawk. Now, Mr. Townsend and Mrs. Sparrowhawk, head and deputy head, 
had not actually spoken to each other for seven years. They hated each other. So you can tell there was a passionate and excited buzz of learning in that school. Uh, the, it was a 60s build again, and the classrooms were in pairs. And there was a communicating door between the two classrooms so that you could have a team. Uh, the communicating door between my room and Mrs. Sparrowhawk's was kept firmly locked. It never communicated in all the time I was in that school. So I didn't learn inspirational there, and that's probably why I'm not exactly inspirational. Mm -hmm. You can do so much to enrich and excite even a fairly basic curriculum. You know, if you go on Google and you Google interesting pictures, you will find some very interesting pictures, <laughs> but don't take those to school. They might inspire, <laughs> but you won't, it, no, don't, don't even go there. But you will find there are loads of photographers who love to share their work, and there's masses of free pictures on there, and you can always find something. There's now great uh, programs, aren't there? Um, the Night Zookeeper, uh, what's, um, Literature Shed, that's right, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Pobble Now, Picture a Day. And uh, so you don't even have to look for them yourselves unless you've got a sad life like me. But what could you do with that? What sort of questioning could you do with that? You could do literal questioning, but it's far better if you want an inspirational curriculum to think of divergent questions that will get the kids to think off track. So Ken Robinson, in one of his brilliant TED speeches, talked about the fact that they took a cohort of kids and tested them at age five for divergent thinking. And 90 odd percent of five-year-olds were divergent thinkers, could think off the piste. They tested the same kids again at age 10 and 60% were divergent thinkers. You can see the pattern, you know where I'm going now, don't you? Age 15, 35% were divergent thinkers. So the answer is, education kills divergent thinking. As he said it, there's only one answer, it's right, if you get it right, and the answer's in the back of the book, and don't look. So there, there you go. But there isn't, there's many answers, and what could the answer to that picture be? And it's great fun for children if they're having to explore their thinking. Where might this picture be going? What can you see? What do you think you can see? That fit with what you were thinking. And of course, if you were in a classroom, you'd be giving them time to talk. Talk is the most important thing. The only way some of your children will expand their vocabulary is through talk. Is that what you were expecting? Now, where might this be? <coughs> Divergent thinking. Well, obviously, it could be a country in the Far East. It could be somewhere like Vietnam or parts of the Philippines. Could it be the River Air in Leeds? Could it be the Thames in London? When might it have been one of those two? so that you're pushing the boundaries to think about realities. They don't look very stressed, do they, the soldiers in that picture? How would you feel if that was coming down towards you? So therefore, is it coming down or is it taking off? Is it a vertical takeoff? Would be even safer. Very, very interesting questions. But it's what you tease them to do with it and the quality of the talk that comes out of it. Now, the handout that my new friend very kindly helped me by distributing, um, it's got all sorts of bits of stuff in it. And I've, as ever, I've talked too long and too fast. Yes. <laughs> He's heckling me down here, you know. It's a good job I love him. You've got a great big thick handout, none of which I'm going to talk about. Oh, that's not the handout. <laughs> that's my criterion scale, forgive me. You've got a thin handout. 
the questioning for purpose, I'm going to put those questions up on for a moment. That came from uh, one of my earlier publications on Talk the Big Talk. Once I worked out, thank you very much, that the voice, writing voice was the most important thing, it became very clear what the problem was. And I, my maxim for the last 17 years that I've been doing big writing as a consultant has been, if the kid can't say it, the kid can't write it. You've only got one bank of words in your brain and they're here on the left-hand side. Every word you know is there. I know how many words you probably know. I know how many words I know. And I know that you want to know how I know how many words you know. And I'm not telling you because I haven't left enough time for it. So you'll have to come back and see me again. But I know 33,888 words and they're all there. And that's phenomenal, isn't it, when you think about it? Your number will be similar. Because consciously, I could never write down all those 33,000 and odd words. And I probably wouldn't live long enough to do it either. And yet my subconscious can sort and sift and select words for purpose faster than the speed of conscious thought, far faster. What speed must be going at now to enable this stream of drivel to come out of my mouth and bombard your ears? I haven't pre-planned what I'm going to say. I know loosely what I'm going to say, but I never get down to the minutiae when I'm planning. See, there's a word. I haven't used that word for many, many years. Minutia, that's a nice word, isn't it? It's a wow word. Where, why on earth did my subconscious pull that up then? A lot of the words in your brain store, they will only pull up for a definite purpose. There has to be a stimulus that makes you recall some of those words. It's, it, it just blows me away when I think about it. So I talk, wrote a book, which is out of date now. I'm not trying to sell it, certainly not. But I have given you a snippet here, chapter four, the importance of talk. And those questions were in that book. Uh, and the uh, giving you some model openers that will steer questions in different directions when you're wanting to aim for divergent thinking. What I really wanted to show you was these mini missions. These are also, they're in a different book, which is also out of date and I would refuse to sell it to you because it's the old curriculum. But they are a model of how to wake up a mediocre curriculum. These, I, I've turned on to year, to year six because it's the last of the three pages. I gave you year two, year three, year, year two, year four, year six. There is year one, obviously, in the book. They are written to a thematic curriculum, which is also in that book. It was called the Creative Curriculum. And curriculum planning was one of my greatest pla passions uh, in the 90s and 2000s. So when you have got the core learning of the theme done, the celebration could be something like a mini challenge. And I particularly like the year six example here because they're actually all working on the same skills, but they're given a choice. And that's the important word, choice. Empowering and exciting kids to do the work through choosing the one they want to do. And that's where exams and tests fall down, isn't it? It removes choice from the child. Do you know when I took the 11 plus back in, oh gosh, I don't know, uh, if I was born in 44, how old was I when I took the 11 plus? I mean, I was 11. <laughs> that's a stupid question. <laughs> 1955, I've got there, it's all right. Uh, 1955. The writing test, and it was a test, and it was sent away to be marked along with the maths, and a, a, an anonymous test 
which later turned out to be an IQ <coughs> test, but we didn't know the word <laughs> IQ then. Uh, there were three choices on the writing test. How cool is that? Giving a kid a choice of which stimulus they want to respond to. Far better chance of doing themselves justice than just saying, write that, and I don't care if you're not interested or you know nothing about it. You know, the worst writing sat that the government ever set was a day at the seaside. It shows how little they know about our country. I was strategy manager in Bradford at the time, and I could have told them that most of the Bradford city, wonderful rich mix of ethnic groups, most of them did not think going and sitting on wet sand in a howling gale, drinking tea out of a cracked mug, was a cool thing to do in the holidays. They'd never had a day at the seaside. How on earth could they write that story? You have to know your children, don't you? And the people who set tests don't know our children. But I just thought you might find those mini challenges interesting because you're setting the kids free in twos or threes for two weeks I would give for that to do all of it and they all involve some research, some application, some deduction, some construction of some sort and then a final delivery of what they've done to their peers. So a wonderful day of everybody sharing back what their mini mission had given to them. Rosenshine, I, I've only come to him very recently. He's worth looking up, his principles for education. There's a summary of them, there's 10 principles. I was very excited by him, not because it's anything new, but because it's a ratification of everything I've always believed. He believes in breaking down learning into the, sorry, I'll get my head out of the way, Chris. I've got Much one with better. you in it and then one without. So it's double, double. I'd use the one without, love. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Breaking learning down into very small steps. And if any of you have heard me before, you'll know that big writing is very much about teaching in small steps. And staying on a step until the kids have really got it. And opening every day, every lesson on that subject with a review of what they learned the lesson before and opening every week with a review of what they learned the week before and opening every month with what a, a review of what they've learned over the previous month and it's that constant re-expression and getting the children to express it that embeds it from short-term memory into long-term memory and gives them the ability to apply it. And I'm passionate about that. Big writing is based on that premise. And he's saying that when you, you don't ask them to use it totally independently until you know they know it. And then you're watching listening and questioning and you pick up on errors and misunderstandings immediately and explain them. Don't leave them. Don't think I won't disturb you. And that's what his principles are expressing loosely. And I was excited to find that someone had, and he's quoting a lot of other researchers. There's a lot of researchers have contributed <coughs> similar ideas to that. And this is back to those questions that you've got model openers because he's very keen on giving kids models when they're in the learning stage and giving them scaffolds when they're in the learning stage. So if I was going to apply some of those models to one of my pictorial things, I could give them a picture which might interest and stimulate them and that's the idea of using visual literacy. <coughs> And then I could flick it off and I could go for those literal questions. Recall a fact, what colour was the, was the quad bike or whatever it is? It was red. What colour was his helmet? 
White. What was the number on the front? Seven. <laughs> One, five, six, I think. <laughs> How many wheels had dropped off? Two, two. Very good. How high off the ground do you think it was? Ah, that's subtle, you see. I'll put it back up. How high off the ground do you think it is? Now, the ground is sloping downwards, isn't it? There's quite a lot of thought for a child to dig into that question. If they don't take account, if they're just looking... I wish my clicker had worked. If they're just looking at the space between the quad bike and the horizon of the hill, they're going to say, what, a yard, a metre? But if they take account of the slope, it's going to be quite a different answer. Now, go digging further into the divergent thinking. With your friend, find an explanation for that bike. What is happening in that picture? And I haven't left enough time. I've got to stop or you'll miss your lunch time. And we haven't had a playtime yet. Never mind. <laughs> But yes, exactly, you've got it in one. It isn't necessarily that he came over the hill so fast that his wheels are dropping off. It could be a supersonic flying machine and when it rises off the ground, it sheds its wheels to lighten itself and then when he wants to land, he has to come back over the exact spot and the wheels will come back up. <laughs> Can you see where kids could go with that if you allow them to be divergent thinkers and don't say, don't be silly, he's just come too fast over the hill <coughs> and his wheels are dropping off. So it's about, oh my goodness me, kids, just look at that. <laughs> Quick as a flash, tell your friends, what's the man thinking? <laughs> How many of you only used one word? <laughs> How many of those words had four letters? <laughs> How many were help? <laughs> There's more than one answer. We teachers have it wrong and it's never in the back of the book. I want to thank you all very, very much for turning down the popular show next door and coming to me. I've had fun and I hope you've had a bit too. I love you. I love you. I love you. Now for God's sake, go and have a week and get some lunch.